Hi folks, and welcome back to The Original Church. Did the original Christians practice confession, penance, and reconciliation? Did the original Christians confess their sins to their clergy? You probably already know this, but in James chapter 5, Jesus' stepbrother mentions two things that would become sacraments of the church. The first is the anointing of the sick, and the other is confession. Notice that James says we need to confess to someone, not just confess directly to God in our hearts, but we need to say it out loud. And there are good reasons for this, partly because we need to be held accountable to someone else to make sure that it doesn't just become one big con we play on ourselves, justifying and enabling our own sin. Jesus himself claimed the power to forgive sins, which at the time a lot of people thought was crazy because they thought only God the Father can forgive sins. But what was even more crazy was the fact that not only did Jesus claim the power to forgive sins, he delegated that power to others. He gave the apostles the authority to forgive sins. When he gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit, he said to them, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. This is what he refers to as binding and loosing in Matthew chapter 16. Binding is to hold on to something, to retain it, so that would be to refuse to forgive a sin. The loosing is to let something go, like an archer looses an arrow into the sky. And that would be to forgive a sin, to free a person from their sins. And this authority to forgive sins, Jesus gave it to his apostles, and they handed it down to the bishops, who are the successors of the apostles. And the bishops delegated this authority to the priests, just like some of the other sacraments. But doesn't James say, confess to each other? Yes, he does. But obviously, it doesn't just mean find someone who will pat you on the back and say, it's okay, and enable your sin. It means to be in a relationship of accountability. So, how did we get from confess to each other to confess to a bishop or priest? Well, let me tell you the story. Now you have to remember that originally confession was just part of the Eucharist. You would never receive the Eucharist without first confessing your sins. And you might also remember what Jesus said about reconciling with a brother or sister before you go to the altar to worship. Set your sacrifice aside and first be reconciled and then you worship. And so there were and there still are prayers of confession built into the prayers leading up to when we receive the Eucharist. But what happens when the sin is more than just between you and God? Well, in the original church, there was a sense in which public sins required a more public acknowledgement and confession. Imagine a congregation where everyone knew what you did anyway. Maybe you belong to a congregation like that. The great spiritual writer John Climacus wrote this, Wounds shown in public will not grow worse, but will be healed. Well, you also have to remember that what becomes the sacrament of confession is part of what we call the discipline of the church. And Jesus also said, If you refuse to forgive someone's sin, that sin is not forgiven. So the church, from the apostles through to the bishops, has the authority to refuse to forgive sin as well. And the Apostle Paul had said that there are times in extreme cases where a sin is so grave and the person so unrepentant that he advocated excommunicating that person. Remember, excommunication means to be excluded from communion. So a person who is excommunicated is not welcome at the table of the Eucharist until they confess and until they are reconciled. And from the beginning, the discipline of the church, including excommunication and reconciliation, all of that was always under the authority of the bishop. To be reconciled to God meant being reconciled to the church, and to be reconciled to the church and to the table 
meant being reconciled by the bishop. Eventually, the sacrament itself came to be called reconciliation, but it assumes confession and it includes penance. We'll get to that in a minute. In the third century, there was a terrible wave of persecution by the Romans. For the first time, an emperor demanded that all inhabitants of the empire make a sacrifice to the pagan gods and in his honor, essentially worshiping the emperor, as a test of loyalty and patriotism. And anyone who refused could lose everything and could be executed for treason. Now, many Christians made the sacrifice, assuming they could just confess it later. But this caused a serious controversy in the church. Now, imagine if you had loved ones who were tortured or executed. Imagine if you lost your home and your livelihood because you kept the faith, and then in church next Sunday, here comes the guy you know made the sacrifice to save his business or to save his life. What would you do? Well, public sins require public confession. And just like in the Old Testament, where a priest was required to proclaim a person healed of leprosy, now in the church, a bishop or priest was required to proclaim the person healed of sin. Now remember, a sacrament is still something that God does. And so the forgiveness ultimately comes from God. But there is a sense that the church has the authority to affirm or even proclaim that forgiveness. And so it can't just be about patting each other on the back and reassuring ourselves that it's okay. Sin is a serious, serious problem. And the church fathers talked about it like it was a disease. Sin is a disease. The church is a hospital. The clergy are the doctors and the sacraments are the medicine. Also remember that even though a person might be baptized, a person can lose his or her salvation through habitual, repeated, serious sin, mortal sin. But the medicine for the healing from sin is confession and reconciliation. Now, it's a long story, and I don't have time to get into all of it here, but it was throughout this controversy in the third century that the sacrament of confession and reconciliation was standardized for the Western Church. So, what about penance? First, it's very important to understand this. Penance is not making up for the sin. No one could do that. And forgiveness is by God's grace and God's mercy. We cannot earn God's forgiveness and we cannot make up for the sin. But penance is the part we do to participate in the sacrament. It is what we do to show the sincerity of our repentance. And when the sin was public, the penance was also public. In fact, during that time of persecution in the third century, the penance for having denied the faith to save your life, that penance could take years. But when it was over, there was reconciliation. The point is, we can't earn the forgiveness but we can participate in the healing process. It is a cooperation in the process of salvation. And even St. Paul himself says that we, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So penance is the way we participate in the process of healing from sin. And in the original church, penance was mostly about the three sort of traditional or classic spiritual disciplines of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And we know that the original church had always practiced penance because of the way the church fathers talk about almsgiving as a penance from the beginning. Now, there was a moment during this controversy in the third century when lay people started offering each other forgiveness. The confessors, those people who had refused to give up their faith and risked their lives but hadn't been executed, some of them still languishing in prison, they started offering forgiveness to the people who had denied the faith. But all of this was threatening to create chaos and it could have led to abuse. And so at that point, it was affirmed that confession, penance, and reconciliation 
the discipline of the church, all of that is under the authority of the bishops. And so it cannot be good enough for a lay person to offer that absolution. A person needs to submit to someone in authority for the sake of humility and to avoid just us just fooling ourselves into justifying our sin. Confession cannot be completely private because sin is not private. And confession cannot be simply between equals who can too easily justify each other's sins and let us off too easily. The reconciliation then has to be part of a healing process under the authority of the bishops and the priests to whom he might delegate it. And that reconciliation in the original church was done in front of everyone with the laying on of hands. And this was called the peace of the church. And so sometimes Catholics are asked, well, how could you ever know if you'd done enough good things to earn your salvation? Or how could you ever know if you'd made up for your sin? You see, our peace of mind doesn't come from doing enough or making up for. Our peace of mind comes from the authority of the church to forgive our sins through the sacrament of confession, penance, and reconciliation. This is where the peace comes from. I'll just make one more point before I close here. Always remember that in the original church, you can lose your salvation. There's no sense of, you know, once saved, always saved, or anything like that. Even when you're baptized, you can lose your salvation. Also remember that in the original church, baptism only washes away original sin and sins committed up to the point of baptism. Baptism does not wash away future sins that you haven't committed yet when you get baptized. And that may seem kind of outrageous, but I was actually told this growing up in a Protestant denomination. I was told that your baptism washes away past, present, and future sins. But that was never the understanding of baptism in the original church. That idea only comes in in the Protestant Reformation when the Reformers got rid of the sacrament of confession and reconciliation. Once you get rid of that sacrament, then what do you do about sins committed after your baptism? You have to pretend that the baptism washes away those too. But in the original church, that was never the case. Baptism doesn't wash away future sins, and you can't get baptized again. So what do you do about post-baptismal sin? You go to the sacrament of confession and reconciliation. So, did the original Christians confess to their clergy? Yes, they did. Minor sins were and still are covered by the Eucharistic prayers, but major sins, the mortal sins, require greater accountability. And they require more than the Eucharist to participate in the healing process. So did the original church practice penance and reconciliation? Yes, it did. Because the church is like a hospital, and the clergy are the doctors. And you can't just make a deal with your friends that if either of you get sick, you'll heal each other. It doesn't work that way. You need a doctor when you get sick, and you need the church when you sin. And so for the healing of sin, you need the sacrament of confession and penance and reconciliation. And that's how it is, and that's how it was in the original church. Thanks for joining me. Cheers. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends, and please join me in the original church community on Locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the original church community on Locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there and I'll see you there.